Um, I'm delighted to welcome our next speaker, um, Professor, Professor Matthias Rillig. Um, Matthias is Professor of Ecology at Freie University in Berlin and is also Director of the Berlin Brandenburg Institute of Advanced Biodiversity Research. Uh, Matthias studied undergraduate degrees in Kaiserslautern and in Edinburgh uh, before doing a PhD in ecology at um, University of California Davis and San Diego State University, followed then by a postdoc at the Carnegie Institute in Washington in the Department of Plant Biology at Stanford. So Matthias' interests are in the area of soil biodiversity, especially fungi and the effects of drivers on global change with the soils. Um, so really looking forward to hearing his aspect on soil health. So over to you, Matthias. Yeah, thanks very much, Sasha. Um... I was just stunned seeing my picture from um, a couple of months ago, but since I've had a haircut, I'm happy to say. And so I don't know if you can see my slides. Can I have yeah, I can see. That's good. Awesome. So um, I'm going to contribute the perspective of global change on soil health. And my goal today is to try to convince you that one of the biggest threats to soil health is one that we rarely think about, namely this the concurrent action of um, many um, global change drivers that happen at the same time. Um, and so by, by virtue of leading into this topic, I want to just leave you with, with two statements here in the beginning slides. Our soils are a major target of drivers of global change, if we like it or not. And um, soils can be part of the solution or they can make everything worse if we don't take care of soil health. So um, what's actually the issue here and why is it um, so important to talk about these multiple global ch change drivers? Well, when you look at the literature in, in global change, um, basically you will always encounter the famous big four that everybody talks about. It's warming, nitrogen deposition, drought, and elevated atmospheric CO2. This is what the majority of work maybe is on and the immediate thing people think about when they hear global change. But just a few years ago, I saw this fantastic paper by Emily Bernhardt, it's actually spelled with TT, um, where she, or they made the argument that um, there's a lot of synthetic organic chemicals that are being released into in our environment. And this has been the realm of ecotoxicologists to study in the past. And why shouldn't we as ecologists also include that in the canon of global change factors? And so I'm adding to the slide a lot of synthetic organic chemicals like PFAs and pesticides. And then there's plastic pollution, like the enigmatic um, cup here and, and lid. And if these materials fragment in the environment, you have what's called microplastic, which is something that my lab has been uh, studying in a lot in the last couple of years. And uh, it's since become clear that this material is virtually everywhere and causing um, a range of effects on soils. And so now we add microplastic to this list. And of course, we can go on and on. And you know, there's salinity problems, there's compaction problems, there's heavy metals, there's artificial light at night, there's invasive species. Usually think about it in terms of plants, but there's also probably soil, or there are also soil organisms that can be invasive. So basically, there's a lot of factors. And the the point is that a lot of these factors factors can be potentially acting concurrently at the same time. They will not all, of course, be on at every site, but if you look at a large enough landscape, you will find that there is a mosaic where uh, a lot of these factors are actually acting on our soils. And this is what I want to talk to you about today. So starting with what do we actually know about this? And when I say, what do we know about this is that what do we know from experimental work on this topic, not observational studies, but experiments. And so we did a systematic mapping a few years ago on um, what experimental work has been done on soils and global change. And this is basically a summary of some of these results. Um, you can see on the left panel here, there is, we recounted basically for every paper, there were a couple thousand papers that we screened. How many factors did they use in the experiment? And, you know, I'm sure it's not surprising. Most of them used one or two factors and hardly any paper looked at more than three or four factors. And this is also a trend that basically has just not changed at all through time. 
So basically 98.2% of papers describing experiments on global change effects on soil used only one or two factors, which means we are pretty much blind in terms of experimental work, what happens when you have more than these two factors, which are arguably happening out there. You can ask yourself, why is this work not being done? Um, there's a couple of reasons I came up with. There's like logistical constraints. There is a lot of effort involved in gearing up for exposure to these different factors. Um, there is a lot of reliance out there on, I will be doing just fine by capturing mostly the main factors, the important factors, the big four that I mentioned before. Uh, there's a fair amount of research compartmentalization going out there, siloing basically in terms of research questions. Imagine people that work on elevated CO2 will rarely then also work on something like invasive species. And of course, the probably the most fundamental reason is that there's a combinatorial explosion problem, um, which means, you know, this is the number of beer glasses clinking when you prost each other in the pub or in the beer garden. Um, the more of these players you have, uh, the faster does this number of um, combinations go up. So if you have 10 factors of global change, let's say, uh, because this is what we worked on, and you have only two levels of each factor, so you're talking about 1,024 treatment combinations. And of course, no ecologist can uh, really do experiments like that because you need to also replicate and so forth. So this is really why we know so little about this. So what did we do? So we set up this experiment. This is um, actually the first experiment I've set up myself because um, when I asked for volunteers in the lab to set it up, so I actually basically all hands stayed down on this one. And this is just a tiny fraction of this experiment. This is an experiment done like in small little tubes of uh, 30 grams of soil to which we've applied a number of factors. And here's what we basically did. I'm also going to show you the first result from my favorite response variable, soil aggregation. But basically, uh, we had a control, we had drought, we had nitrogen deposition, temperature increase, microplastic glyphosate, antibiotics, fungicide, copper, salinity, and insecticide. So all separately replicated um, a few times. So we could uh, get effect size estimates for all these factors. Actually, this had rarely been done um, that you use the same soil in the same experimental settings and you just let loose basically 10 factors and see what, what happens really. And so you can see, um, this is the control here. Some of the factors had no effect. Some of the factor caused a decrease. Some of the factors caused an increase. And um, actually, you know, not so surprising what you would expect. However, then, you know, the um, the problem is how do you deal with these many factors? We can't do a complete factorial experiment with 10 factors because it would have 1,024 treatment combinations. So what we did is we stole an experimental design from biodiversity, biodiversity ecosystem functioning experiments where you have a pool of, in that case, species. In our case, we made that global change factors. So we have a pool of 10 global change factors, the, the ones I've just mentioned to you. And for every replicate of a certain uh, treatment level, let's say two factors, we did random draws from this pool of factors and every replicate, every experimental unit got um, the results from this random draw in terms of treatment. So in one treatment, it might have been microplastic and pesticide, and next it must have been could have been warming and drought, and another one copper and um, insecticide. And so <laughs> basically, you know, what you need to understand is like every replicate of this particular treatment level having two factors is the treatment level, the factor level, um, had completely different composition by chance of um, the actual factors. So that was the trick. We basically separated the number of factors, factors from the composition and identity of these factors. It's actually, it sounds like a pretty crazy idea, but I'll show you maybe that it wasn't. So we did this in this experiment. We had um, two, five, eight and all 10 factors basically represented with this random draws that I just explained to you. And the one um, on, the, on that right panel here in the panel A, that you can see the little shaded uh, section here is um, we then looked at the results. And um, 
number one, factor number one is just a, is just a combination of all data points from the single factor treatments here. And you know, you might expect from what I just told you about what this experiment was like, that you would get like a crazy mess of data points being all over the place because individual variables or individual treatments, I should say, had positive, negative, neutral effects. What happens if you just randomly combine them? Um, but it wasn't. Right? The, the big surprise actually to me was that there was a directional, a pretty clear directional change towards a decrease in ecosystem properties or soil properties, ecosystem process rates. I'll show you some examples of that. And it's very clear for water stable soil aggregates, this um, decreases with the number of factors, irrespective of what these factors actually are. So. I don't have time to go into all the details of the statistics, but you can see like that you can of course formulate null model expectations from knowing the individual effect sizes of the different variables. And um, you can see the experimental results here with the black um, symbols in figure panel B deviate more and more from those null model expectations. And with machine learning algorithms, we could basically explain 50% of the variability of these data points just by knowing the number of factors. And this, of course, increased once we added additional information like factor identity. I mean, this was pretty surprising, um, but there were also some real other surprises. And that is when we measured soil water repellency, this was just measured with the water drop penetration time, which probably most of you know, it's just uh, putting a water droplet on the soil surface and measuring the number of seconds it takes for this water drop to soak into the soil. Um, for the single factor treatments, there was basically no effect except for a little effect in, uh, of drought, which is well documented for the sandy soils we work here, uh, work on here in, in Berlin. But then when we used more than five or even eight or 10 of these factors randomly combined, then suddenly this variable shoots up. And basically in your mind going back to what I showed you before that most studies in terms of experiments stop with considering one or two factors very rarely do studies take more factors into consideration well this would have all missed basically this particular effect of this increase in soil water repellency that only started with having five eight or then even all ten factors combined um, we actually don't know what causes this we have a number of ideas but um, that is, of course, also a bit of the, the limitation of this approach. This is not without limitations, obviously. Um, you gain access to some of the um, higher dimensionality of factor levels this way by this random sampling from a pool, but you do lose the resolution of what happens when individual factors are combined, right? Because it's just all random draws. We're currently working on refining some of these machine learning tools and um, are doing some other experiments and some other designs as well. But this will be remaining as a fundamental limitation of this particular approach. And of course, in this case, our variability explained was very little because we had very little basis to go on from um, the single factor effects in this case, since there was just basically flat line. And so um, this is an overview. You can see the details here. I showed you some of these results uh, already from the top two panels. And then we also measured decomposition and soil respiration. And you can see it just by looking at this gray shape. This was the same story basically all along. There's this directional uh, change in properties and ecosystem um, process rates. And we also um, did some high throughput sequencing on the fungal community in these soils. It was a pretty diverse functional, uh, fungal community because it's from an undisturbed grassland that had one and a half hours um, outside of Berlin. And so we had the ASV richness or the amplified sequence of variance richness, which is, you can think of it as in terms of something like the species richness. And, um, you know, this also, even though the individual uh, effects were all over the place, overall, we see for all of these community level parameters, richness, composition and dispersion, which is a measure of how far away you are from the central, basically typical community in any one of these um, treatment levels, we see this directional change in community composition, species richness and dispersion. Uh, for those of you who like fungi, like us, basically the fungal uh, subset that suffered 
um, most dramatically from this increasing level of um, global change drivers that were impinging on these soils were the basidium mycota. So the basidium mycota really uh, declined very rapidly um, with this increased fun um, um, factor levels and uh, the ascomycota and other um, zygomycetes fungi suffered comparatively less, which is kind of interesting for us. Um, so there's then also, to summarize this up, uh, effects on biodiversity. In this case, fungi, we've since also sequenced um, bacteria and protists, and um, I'm hoping, well, <laughs> we're, we're expecting to, be, to see similar effects also there. Now you might, of course, say this is maybe a one-off results. There are these but there are these tubes and um, um, maybe it was just a particular selection of treatment levels. Of course, we had to make choices which treatment levels to pick and also which factors to include. And we made a particular choice of one soil. We repeated this since with um, twice as many experimental units here um, at low and high soil biodiversity and also with a different soil, with a different experimental setup, with different factors and uh, different levels. And we basically found um, essentially the same pattern again, that there is this decline of ecosystem process rates, biodiversity um, and soil properties in all basically soil health um, with increasing levels of factors. And what we are currently setting up this is, uh, can, if you could see my hands, you, <laughs> you would believe me, is like um, this field experiment where we're doing exactly this. We're setting up this experiment here, 10 minutes away from the Institute in a grassland that we have planted. You can see the plots here and um, we're applying these 10 factors and the factors in, in, in combination also in the field. And I'd be very curious to see what happens there it should be set up by the end of October. Okay, so what does this all mean? Well, first of all, it means um, we've still got a lot to do. We currently know really little about soil responses to a multitude of these very many jointly concurrently acting factors. And I believe we really need to think more about this because there could be all these surprises lurking behind this high dimensionality of factor impacts, like we saw in this case for soil water repellency, but there may be many other surprises where maybe there is um, sudden changes in uh, system performance once you exceed a certain level of factors. We didn't really see that, right? In our graph, there was a basically, basically a continuity of uh, decline, as it were, but um, it's also possible that with certain combinations and factors and factor levels, uh, we could see more severe sudden declines, so these tipping points. Um, I should also say that when we picked these factor levels of these 10 different factors, we picked them to be relatively mild. So we picked them to be sort of at the low level of what you could do, what you would naturally find, what has been measured in Germany and, and, and uh, Europe in terms of levels. So they weren't like, um, Hitting, hitting him over the head, basically, they were relatively mild. Certainly need new ideas and experimental approaches, of which this is maybe one example. Also, what we did is we took this to a more conceptual level, and um, this was my last year summer project. I basically looked at a factor pool of 30 global change factors, and I asked myself, how can I classify them in terms of biological, chemical, and physical, or combined physical and chemical um, traits in terms of, you know, what is the proximate effect? What is the effect direction? What are some key properties of these factors? Strictly from first principles, no data, just thinking about what is this factor in its basic nature. And when you do that, you come up with a tree, right? A dissimilarity tree of these traits of factors, like a phylogenetic tree for species. And then you can ask yourself, is there any resemblance between this um, abstract tree of factors and experimental results? And in fact, there was. So we used our data from the experiment that I've just shown you, and we find a better than a better correspondence than expected by chance alone of this purely abstract trait classification of factors and our actual experimental results. So this is very encouraging because it means that maybe with these global change factor classifications where I'm now working on more could actually help us um, predict some of these effects in the end. 
well, what can we do to help? Um, so as I've shown you, we, we showed we, we saw these progressive reduction in process rates and biodiversity with factor number. So that, of course, the obvious message here is we need to reduce the number of factors acting on our soils. And everything we do, every measure that reduces fractionally some of these uh, factors impinging our soils will probably help soil health because, because we're moving back along this line. And another message that I learned for myself is that we need to unify the message because people have a limited pool of worry. This is in the paper that just came out um, uh, this week in Nature Ecology Evolution. Um, people cannot constantly worry about new stuff, about warming, climate change, microplastic, salinity, copper. No, we need to unify it all under the topic of global change. So there's one term that everybody can sort of rally around. And with that, I'm at the end. I'd like to thank um, my lab here. This was our last Christmas picture. It was basically selfies because we couldn't meet and um, people that contributed to the research that I shared with you today mostly are listed here. And um, also thanks to these funding agencies and you for your attention. Thanks very much. Be happy to entertain questions. Thank you, Matthias. That, that was an absolutely fascinating presentation. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you're gonna have a lot of questions here, but we. We've certainly got time for a few, so I'm going to hand over to Dan to, to kick us off. And there's quite a few to choose from, so I'm going to see if I can just pick some selection and then put some of them into the panel discussion as well. Um, so the first one uh, I've got here is, how do you deal with many factors and the issue of scale? Uh, I imagine that spatial scale, uh, as the interaction becomes between the factors is likely to change with the scale. So how do you deal with that? Yeah, that is a fantastic question. <laughs> it's uh, firstly because it is a really good question and second because we've also had this question and asked ourselves this question. And so uh, there is not only this change of uh, factor interactions with scale, but also different factors start even acting or even becoming an issue in the first place at different scales. You know, think about very many aspects of land use change. Land use change is a factor that, you know, enters the ecological hierarchy at a much higher level than say like salinity, which like acts as sort of a micro scale already. Uh, land use uh, change like the construction of a road is a completely different question. And uh, another, another reason why this is a very good question is of course that the, your pool of factors will change if you go to different uh, spatial scales and also you may encounter different combinations of different factors that are active in different levels of the landscape because you know many of these factors are acting locally <laughs> you know whether they, they are global in occurrence but they're still uh, fairly local in terms of the manifestations. Think for example, like nitrogen deposition is a very high in, in areas around cities so with a lot of car traffic or um, animal husbandry or whatever, but there is, um, there's gonna be a different combination of which factors are um, it probably worth worrying about as you move across the landscape. So I think this is an, an excellent question, one that interests us a lot. And one, I guess we can pick up in the panel discussion as well. I guess scale is, is quite a, a, a generic uh, topic to discuss. So um, this next one then, uh, where they're dominant interacting factors in changing the impacts, it doesn't look like it from the analysis, but looking at the stresses imposed, there should be either aggregate stability or repellency, uh, example, salinity and drought. So were there any dominant interacting factors, Matthias? No. <laughs> so there weren't, you know, because we specifically, I didn't have time to go into that because one of the null models specifically tests for this is the dominative null model. It, it tries, basically it tries to go through, what if it's only the effect with the, um, the highest effect size were breaking through, will that explain the results? And the answer is no, it did not. So we don't have this, you know, sampling effect of um, a dominant factor always breaking through. And it was not a function, even though it would have also been interesting, it was not a function of with the number of factors increasing, you also increase the probability of including a disproportionately uh, effect, you know, high effect basically factor. It, it wasn't that. Um, 
but it highlights one of the various things that can happen when you have uh, more factors coming into play. You have this basically sampling effect, as it's called in biodiversity ecosystem function, where a disproportionately influential species will just simply increase in probability of being, in, the probability of including the species in your pool will simply increase when you uh, select more species. The same is true with many factors. Um, but I think what happens is more like there is this interactions among these factors. Uh, we've just thought about what can be the nature of these interactions. Actually, it's just a paper that came out. Um, they can, um, that the probability of having more and more of these factor interactions also increases with having more and more factors included. And I think in a way we were a little bit lucky in the experiment that we didn't have very many of these strongly dominant effects. Uh, because you would have in the end just seen these sampling effect and not these interact diffuse interactions. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, so th there is a question I wanted to slip in about how this information could be used in practice, but I might put that in the panel discussion because that could be quite a good talking point. So um, yeah, without further ado, I'll hand back to Sacha. Thank you, Matthias, for that. Thanks. Thank you again, Matthias. Uh, while there's some advantages to uh, the online presentation system, um, I am looking forward to when we can meet again in person and chat with speakers over coffee. Um, I'm looking forward to that. I'm sure we would have some very interesting conversations and maybe we can pick those up uh, in the discussion coming up.